Okay, so like I said, today we're going to be starting with spread C. And spread C shouldn't be completely new to most of you guys. Um, apparently, you have covered this in year nine. And um, if you've done biology in semester one, you might have covered this as well. Um, the neuron is basically um, introducing us because look, after we cover spread C, we're looking at the nervous systems. And in order for us to understand the nervous systems, we need to understand the basic function and the basic structure of a neuron. So that's kind of why we're covering this today. So first of all, we're looking at what is a neuron, okay? The neuron is simply defined as the basic functional unit of our nervous system. So before we understand this, we need to understand that whenever we do something, whether it's picking, um, you know, picking up a piece of clothing from the floor of your room, okay? Whether it is, um, you know, picking up a mug of coffee and feeling that it's hot, okay? Whether it's a movement or whether it's a sensation, all of these functions that allow us to feel, that allow us to move, that allow us to do our daily functions and complete tasks in our lives are only possible because we have millions of neurons that are communicating with one another to carry that information. Whether that information represents a motor message, thus allowing us to move, or whether that information represents a sensory message, allowing us to feel that, oh, I'm walking on a tiled floor, uh, floor and it's cold, I need to put on some slippers, okay? So all of that information is carried by that basic functional unit, by that kind of messenger, which we call as the neuron, okay? Um, we're going to learn also today that different types of neurons carry different types of information. So although this is the basic kind of generic um, neuron that most of us are familiar with, um, we do have different types of neurons. Okay, so we've got motor neurons, we've got sensory neurons, we've got interneurons. So we're going to learn about those three as well. Without neurons, we can't really do any of the planned tasks that we um, intend on doing every single day. Okay, for example, when you're walking from class to class, or in this case, walking from, you know, your study desk to your bed and back and forth okay that stuff basically is only possible because we have neurons that allow us to be able to get out of bed allow us to be able to walk towards an area that we need to be okay so all of these functions are because of the um, action of not just one single neuron but many neurons working together and those neurons form what we call as neural pathways or kind of chains of neurons that are working together the three types of neurons we're going to learn about are sensory motor and interneurons and I'll explain what these other words next to them mean in a bit. Okay so the main reason like I said we're studying neurons in this spread is because we need to understand that they are essential to the functioning of our um, central and peripheral nervous systems. That's going to be covered on Monday when we do spread D. Okay so um, that's what a neuron is. Now this is a basic neuron. You need to be able to understand um, not just what the neuron's function is, but also the different components of the neuron. Okay, so for example, you need to know what the dendrites do. You need to know what the soma is. You need to know the axon terminals, the myelin or the myelin sheath, and you need to know the axon. Okay, all of these things, you need to not just know what they are in terms of their name, but you need to know what function that they have with reference to communication between and within the neuron. Okay, so you need to be able to label a neuron, in other words. Okay, a lot of the time on the internet, if you're finding um, diagrams of neurons on the internet, sometimes those diagrams are a little too advanced. Um, in fact, they include different components like the nodes of Ranvia and Schwann cells and other things that we don't actually need to know. So just try to stick to this diagram because this diagram is kind of the more simplified version. When we look at the arrow above here that says um, that's showing it kind of going towards one direction, this is because um, message travel or message transmission is kind of a one-way concept okay so we've got a sending neuron which basically sends or transmits a message or neural impulse to a receiving neuron okay and that receiving neuron can't really um you know send it back to the original neuron from which it received it so it's just a one-way communication so just to give you guys a more simplified um representation of that if neuron a is sending to neuron b Neuron B can't just be like, oh, actually, here you go. Here's your message back. That can't happen, okay? Because neural communication is a one-way process. It's a one-way process also because when A, neuron A sends to neuron B, 
and then neuron B sends to neuron C, and then C sends to D like that. What you see is we actually get a chain of neurons happening. And remember, I said that a chain of neurons is also known as a neural pathway. So one of the reasons why we have one-way message transmission is to allow for the formation of those neural pathways. And those neural pathways represent our information and knowledge. For example, if you have a knowledge of, um, let's say timetables, okay, you know that two times two is four, you know, seven times eight is 56, whatever, whatever. Those timetables that you learned when you were in primary school, you have a specific neural pathway in your brain that at some point of your life was continuing to activate every time you used to revise your timetables in primary school. Now that you don't revise your timetables as much because you don't need them as much um, and they're not a big part of your maths topics, um, you don't, that neural pathway doesn't get lit up anymore, okay? But you already have that memory now stored in your brain. So it doesn't need to continue to light up or you don't need to continue to revise timetables now, okay? So that's how the neural pathway and the stimulation or activation of the neural pathway can lead to the eventual storage of memories as well. Okay, and that's something you'll learn about more uh, if you would, if you choose to do year 12 uh, psychology there, unit you know, three and four. Okay, so that's basically what the neuron looks like. You need to be able to label it. Okay, you also need to be able to understand that because we're in year 10 and because this is pre-VCE, we do expect you guys to um, use terminology so rather than saying, okay, this is like, rather than saying, okay, in this scenario, neuron A is the sending neuron, we would prefer that you use proper terminology, like it's the presynaptic neuron. And I'll explain what the synapse is as well. Um, and the receiving neuron should be the postsynaptic neuron. So these are just other words for sending and receiving neurons, okay? So that's the basic idea. You should also be able to define each of these components that I've underlined here in green. Um, and I'll show you the definitions for them in the next slide. Okay, this is again just, a, we'll just skip this and go straight to the definitions and come back. So these are the definitions that you need to know. It doesn't have to be word to word, but more or less, there are some important elements in each of those. Neurons are also known as nerve cells. Okay, they're the basic functional unit of the nervous system. So obviously, um, that's the kind of cell that they represent. Um, and a lot of the time when we have a neuron sending a message, to another neuron, message is a very oversimplified way of calling that particular impulse. We actually call that an electrical impulse or a neural impulse. Okay, so that's the basic um, what it represents. But look, at year ten level, you can just call it the message. It's not a big deal. Um, but just to show, you, uh, just to tell you guys that those are some other words for message. Um, the axon is the part of the neuron that basically transmits or sends the message. Okay, sends the message. Sends, sorry, or transmits the message. Okay, and the dendrite is the part of the neuron that actually receives the message. Your dendrites, I'll show you a diagram. I'll go back to the diagram on the previous slide soon. But your dendrites basically look like tree branches. Okay, they look, um, they're basically like spread it out. And as you learn more information or as you revise something, you actually um, see a growth in those dendrites. The same way that when, you know, um, with proper climatic conditions, with proper water um, and stuff like that, tree branches grow over time. Your dendrites also grow just like tree branches and they become bigger and thicker and more dense. Okay, so essentially um, that's what happens when we continue to learn information. Okay, um, the synapses is the tiny gap between two neurons. So if I've got neuron A, neuron B, that's not tiny, let's try that again. Neuron A and neuron B, there'll be a tiny gap between the two um, neurons. And that tiny gap is basically onto which neuron A will initially send or lay down the message. And from there, it then gets um, received by neuron B. Okay, it's actually hard for us to draw what a synapse is like. Um, but that's probably the best way to visualize it. Just as a tiny gap or a tiny area of space between the two neurons um, onto which that particular message and onto which that neurotransmitter is released. So what are neurotransmitters? You might've heard of neurotransmitters before. They're basically chemical substances. So you can contrast that a neuron is an electrical um, impulse, okay? It's electrical in nature, whereas a neurotransmitter is a chemical substance it's chemical in nature that's one way that you can contrast between the two 
Anyway, um, neurotransmitters are chemical substances. They're released from the vesicles. You don't need to worry too much about that. Um, they're released from the axon terminal or the axon terminal buttons into the synaptic gap, which is basically that little gap we talked about, to enhance and to enhance the speed and the transmission of the message as it goes from neuron A, which is our sending or presynaptic neuron, to uh, neuron B, which is our postsynaptic or receiving neuron there. There are different types of neurotransmitters um, that play different functions. For example, uh, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that plays a pretty big role in things like mood as well as movement. Uh, glutamate plays a really big role in learning. Okay, so these are things that if you were to do VCE psychology, you're going to have a better um, understanding of these neurotransmitters. You might have come across these before as well in science in lower year levels. Um, so that's, those are the kind of definitions of your key components of um, a neuron. Okay, is there any, are there any questions about any of these components or what they do? No? Okay, I'm going to go back to the picture here just to show you guys um, this is just one diagram. It's taken from the Year 11 book, um, but I thought it was a pretty clear diagram that shows you um, what the dendrite kind of looks like from a vertical point of view. Okay, if we were to take that, um, sorry, if we were to take that neuron and basically make it look vertical, how would it look like? And this is like the more horizontal view. Um, I think it's easier though to explain how the message uh, reaches through the dendrites back to the axon terminals with this diagram. So I'm just going to draw over this one. Actually, hold on. I think I have another diagram as well. Ah, yes, here we go. This is the one. So this is the one that kind of shows you a visual representation of um, neural communication. Okay. So remember I said that the dendrites look like tree branches. Okay. As we learn new information. So let's say you knew a little bit about psychology last week, and now we're building upon that knowledge. Now we're teaching you more stuff. As you learn more and more information about psychology, we actually see a growth of these dendrites. So remember we said they look like tree branches. So we see a growth of those dendrites and we see them becoming not just a larger in number, but we also see them becoming denser or in other words, thicker. Okay, just like your tree branches, like if you look at a very old tree, the tree branches are very thick, okay, compared to a tree that's just been planted like a year or two ago. So these dendrites get thicker, get bigger, and basically get larger or uh, increase in quantity or number as you learn more information and as you build upon and revise that information. This is literally the biological or neural explanation. So, you know, when we always tell you, you need to revise your information, the more you revise it, the better you'll remember it. This is the biological explanation for why that is. Okay. The more neurons, um, sorry, the more neural pathways that are, are created for a particular bit of information, the more dendrites will be growing. And as you've got more branches, you've got a greater kind of ability to be almost like a sponge to be able to absorb any information. Basically, the more dendrites you have, the more information you can receive and the more information you can thus learn and revise in an easier way. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Anyways, let's get back to what I was talking about. So let's say the message, I'm just going to MSG message. Okay, remember our message is in the form of a neural impulse or an electrical impulse. So let's say that there is another neuron. So we've already got two neurons here. This is the um, sending neuron. This is the receiving neuron. Um, now, when this neuron, we'll call it neuron A, was receiving a message from the previous neuron. No, actually, let's call this neuron neuron B. Okay. We need to remember that one neuron is never only presynaptic or never only postsynaptic. That is to say that a neuron can be both pre and postsynaptic. Okay, in other words, a neuron can both send and receive information. Okay, it's not like I can say, oh, in this case, B will only ever be a postsynaptic neuron because when the message gets released or gets received by neuron B here and travels all the way through its, um, sorry, give me one second. Okay, travels all the way. So the message gets re uh, received here in the soma and travels through the um, axon, okay, reaches the terminal buttons down there. That doesn't mean that, you know, that neuron has only is only a receiving neuron because now that neuron is ready to send the message to the next neuron, which is neuron C. And neuron C in this instance is now a receiving neuron, okay? But when that same message gets received by neuron C here, and again, travels down through the axon into the, you know, axon terminal buttons, 
neuron C is now ready to send that message to neuron D. Okay, so that's what I mean that a neuron can be both pre and post synaptic, it can actually have a sending function or a sending role and a receiving role, depending on whether there's a neuron that's coming after it or before it. Okay, that's the basic idea. Anyway, um, let's have a look at the message now. So again, put the message in there. So this message is received from another neuron, which isn't in this picture, but let's imagine there was another neuron before. So the message is received. The message sits in the soma. The soma is the cell body of the neuron. Okay, it sits in the soma and then starts to basically get attracted towards the axon because that is the place in which um, that is the area through which the axon, the message will actually travel. So think of the axon as being like a tunnel. Okay, you know when you're driving, um, when you're driving and you go through a tunnel. Um, if it's raining outside for some short period of time while you're in the tunnel, your car is protected against that rain because the tunnel kind of acts as an insulation or a protection. So in the same way, when our, if you think of our message as being a car, okay, just an analogy, but if you think of our message as being a car and that car is about to go through this tunnel, which is the axon, what is actually protecting this axon is something called myelin. Myelin is what, as per our analogy, is what actually stops the rain from coming in and um, ruining our car, okay? In the same way, when we've got messages that are being sent from one neuron to another neuron, there's always something called interference that can happen. Okay, when you've got a lot of message uh, messages that are being sent in a close proximity to, to one another, you've got a lot of interference that can occur. In order to protect our neuron and protect, sorry, protect our neural impulse or protect our message from being influenced or slowed down or delayed because of that interference, the myelin, which is this kind of fatty white substance that kind of insulates or protects the axon is actually um, just kind of covering that axon there. So it's really kind of hard to show you guys that in the photo, but um, see these little kind of um, bubbly kind of coverings there. Okay, I'm just trying to draw over them. Okay, the, that blue part that I've highlighted, that is the myelin. And just the stick-like, rod-like structure that's running through the middle that I'm going over in pink, that's the axon. The axon is literally just like a tunnel, remember? It's just a pathway through which the, um, through which the neural impulse or the message travels, okay? So the axon and the myelin are obviously related because the axon is the tunnel or it's the area through which the message travels or is sent, okay? through the um, neuron and the myelin is the fatty white substance that covers or protects that axon in order to ensure that that message can go through the axon at the fastest possible rate without interference, okay? So myelin basically protects against any interference to that message that would otherwise slow it down or delay it, okay? Um, now, as the message goes through the um, axon, so it's kind of traveling, let's pretend it's the green thing here, it's traveling, the message is traveling, 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 going through, going through. Eventually, it'll reach the um, axon terminal buttons or the axon terminal. The axon terminal is an area of space that basically the uh, message waits at before it is released into that tiny gap that we talked about before. Just think about it like a bus terminal or a train terminal or an airport terminal. There's always an area whenever you're going overseas, there's always an area of the airport where you need to go and wait for some time before you board your flight, before you depart, okay? So think of the axon terminal as being similar to that. It's kind of like the waiting area for the, for the um, message or for the neural impulse, okay? So obviously the... Um, the neural impulse or the message waits at the axon terminal until the um, until the neurotransmitter is released into the synaptic gap. Okay. Now this is where this kind of magnified diagram comes um, becomes important for us. So we can see that we've got the axon. Let's say the message was waiting about here. Okay, in the terminal button in the axon terminal area. Okay, these little buds that you can see that have been pointed to that have been called terminal buttons are actually look like buds because they actually contain neurotransmitters, okay? Inside these buds, we have something called vesicles. Vesicles are like little pouches and those pouches contain neurotransmitter. You can see that represented um, as the little green dots in this diagram here, okay? This is our neuro N transmitter. Okay, neurotransmitter. So when the axon terminal senses or detects that a message has reached 
the terminal, these neurotransmitters actually get released into the synaptic gap. Now, sometimes this is called synaptic cleft, it's the same thing. It's just the synaptic gap or the synapse, okay? So the neurotransmitter gets released into the synapse and you can see that we've got these little green um, kind of balls there in the synaptic gap, okay? And what basically happens with the message now is that the message, and this is a very juvenile way of explaining it, but the message basically piggybacks onto a neurotransmitter and then the neurotransmitter helps that message to cross over to the next neuron so if, um, if it's here, it crosses over to the next neuron as fast as possible in a very fast and effective way. Okay, and this is why we say that neurotransmitters increase the speed of neural connections, okay, of neural communication, sorry, because they allow the message to be um, sent across the synapse in the fastest possible way. Okay, and yeah, and then our message is now reached here. Okay, so remember, message piggybacked onto the neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter which was in the synaptic gap, then takes that message to the next neuron. This is the dendrite of the next neuron. So we could say this is the dendrite of neuron um, B. Okay, if this was neuron A that we were talking about the whole time, dendrites of neuron B, our message is here. This is the magnified version of what that looks like. Okay, and then the same process continues. Um, does anyone have any questions about that process? or any confusions, any doubts, anything you need to have clarified? No? Okay, um, cool. So that's just basically an explanation of the whole process that takes place. The reason I explain this process, everyone, is because you'll, be, you'll understand how neurons work and it'll be easier for you to memorize these definitions or understand these definitions when you know what the overall process looks like, okay? It's kind of like um, rather than, you know, if you were cooking a recipe, it's easier for you to first watch the entire recipe and see the procedure rather than me just giving you the names of the ingredients and what they are, yeah? So once you know the whole process, it makes it easier for you to understand what the different components are as well. Uh, okay, question. Does the message just keep traveling through neurons? And when does it stop? So basically what happens is that as the message, our messages only get sent through neurons once we're doing something, like once we're learning something. For example, if you're learning psychology content for this test or something, and um, you know, you're revising content, those that message is getting sent between neurons. But once you stop that particular bit, bit of information and start something else, there'll be a different, that particular neural communication will stop. And then you'll have a whole new different pathway of neurons that will get activated. So for example, your neural pathways in your brain for psychology information will be different compared to the neural pathways in your brain for um, English related information or com compared to what you're learning in humanities, for example. Okay. You know, when we talk about memory and we talk about this idea that, oh, I, I have a good memory of psychology content, or I have a good memory of what happened on, on the day that we, you know, went into lockdown. What we really mean by good memory is a strong neural pathway, okay? When we have a good memory of something or we believe we have a good memory of something, what we're really saying is that we have a strong or a good neural pathway for that information. And what is a neural pathway? It's literally nothing but a chain of neurons that are constantly communicating with one another. That's all it is. So neuron A communicating with neuron B, communicating with neuron C, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's what a neural pathway is. It's a chain of neurons. So that's basically, um, yeah. So once we stop learning that particular bit of information, um, the neurons involved in communicating that specific psychology information or information about how to do our timetables basically stop as well. Okay, and as we move on to the next task, our brain starts sending messages related to that particular task. Yeah. Okay, so that's basically a visual representation of neural communication. Um, okay, before we finish up for today, we're just going to look at the types of neurons. Okay, we've got um, three main types of neurons that you should be familiar with. The reason you need to know all these three types is as we learn about nervous systems on Monday, um, you need to be able to explain, like, for example, when someone picks up their phone from a table, how does that happen? How, does their, how is their hand able to grab the phone? Okay, what are the different neuron, neuronal activities or neural activities or functions behind them being able to do that? 
Okay, so in order for you to understand that, which can be confusing, you really need to understand um, the types of neurons and basically their role. Okay, um, so when we're looking at the types of neurons, we've got the motor neuron, the sensory neuron, and the interneuron. Now, um, some good news for you guys is you don't need to be able to draw or label the sensory or interneuron. In fact, if you were to go into Google Images and type in diagram of a neuron, you would see the one that resembles this. Okay, this is usually used as a generic diagram for all neurons, but actually in reality, when we look at neurons, they actually have different structures. They don't always look the same or exactly look the same, um, but this is the one that we kind of stick to. Okay, This is the typical diagram of a motor neuron, which we also use in general to represent neurons for us. Okay, So just remember this one, don't worry about these two. They're just there for your information to show you that not all neurons look the same, but you won't need to memorize this or be asked to label this. Okay, what you do need to be able to do, however, is you need to be able to understand the function for sensory and motor neurons. Now, can anyone take a guess? It's really easy. What do we, what kind of functions would we use, uh, would motor neurons be involved in? Give me an example of a task you do every day that you think would require a motor neuron. Yeah, walking, picking up something from your table. Yeah, all of those. Any function that basically involves movement will involve a motor neuron, okay? Now, I'll explain what this efferent neurons is in, in one second. Okay, now, when we're talking about sensory neurons, sensory neurons are to do with how we feel sensation, okay? Can anyone give me an example in the chat of a task or something you might do every day that would require a sensory neuron? Yeah, when you eat hot food, for example, if um, if your dad's brought home like, um, you know, um, fish and chips, okay, and it's like really like steaming hot, um, you know, and you want to, and you know, you bite into a chip and it's really hot and it burns your tongue. Then you know that you want to put that chip down and you want to maybe let it cool down a little more. Okay, your ability to feel that the chip was hot or feel that your coffee is still not cooled down enough is because of the role of sensory neurons. Okay, sensory neurons which transmit sensory related information, for example, heat, cold, texture to our brain to allow us to make those judgments. Okay, interneurons are basically um, to do with the communication or to do with connecting both motor and sensory neurons. Sometimes we have tasks that we do that actually involve both motor and sensory functions. Okay, and when we do these particular tasks, it's important that we have a interneuron that's involved there. For example, if I've got a really hot pot, which I know has been cooling down on the stove for a bit, so it's not like boiling. I know it's not going to burn me, but I decide, you know what, let me pick it up. So I pick it up and I realize it's still kind of hot and my hand's starting to hurt a little bit. So then I decide to put it down, okay? It's not like a withdrawal reflex where it's so hot and I drop it on the floor automatically. It's something that I've decided to do. Okay, I've decided it's a little too hot still to carry, so I'm going to put it back on the stove. So that is basically where an interneuron would take place because we have a sensory and a motor function happening in very close proximity to one another, okay, where I feel that the pot is still pretty hot and I put it back down on the stove, okay? So that is basically where interneurons take place. When we need to relay information or messages between motor and sensory neurons um, in a really kind of quick way or in a way where we are working with, uh, both neurons okay for example when we're multitasking as well this might this might play a role um so when we're talking about um i already talked about the drawing of neurons so you only need to be able to label the motor neuron okay now i'm just have one memory tip to give you guys because we do need to know the different terminology we need to know that motor is another that efferent and motor neurons are the same and sensory neurons and afferent neurons are the same so we use the memory tip same, okay, S-A-M-E. So when you look at the word same, you've got, um, that's S for sensory, which also means afferent. That's M for motor neuron, which also is called an efferent neuron. So you can use that, mem um, that memory tip, okay? Um, if you wanna go one further and incorporate uh, interneurons into the picture, you can use the same memory tip same, but it's spelled incorrectly. And now what we have is we've got motor neurons, we've got sensory neurons, and we've got the I for interneurons right in the middle, because we know that interneurons connect um, motor and sensory neurons together. Okay, so that could be another memory tip that you use to incorporate everything there. 
Okay, so if on a SAP or on a test situation, if we give you a question that asks you to explain the activity of the efferent neurons in this scenario, what, we're, what they're really asking you is explain the activity of the motor neurons. If we ask you to explain the afferent activity with the A, then you're being asked to explain the role of the sensory neurons. Okay, so just, just be familiar with that. Look, this is a lot of information. You don't need to struggle too much with this information, but you just need to be able to know that motor is involved in movement and it relays motor related messages and that sensory is involved with sensory um, related information like temperature, heat, cold, pressure, all that kind of stuff. Okay, and the interneurons basically connect sensory and motor. The main reason that interneurons take are involved is because sensory and motor neurons never ever connect directly. They always kind of do their own thing. And so interneurons, you could say, are kind of like the mediator that basically allow these two to come together and to connect with one another, because in every other circumstance, they would never connect. They're kind of isolated from one another. OK, interneurons is what allow them to connect directly with one another. OK, and remember the word inter means between. OK, when we when we think of inter school debating or inter school sports, it means sports that are played between two schools or debating that is done between two schools. So the uh, prefix inter basically means between. So interneurons literally means between neurons. OK, a type of neuron that enables connections to be made between neurons and those neurons that are involved are sensory and motor. OK, so that's another way you can remember that. All righty. Um, cool. So that's sensory motor neurons done. Look, with this CNS, PNS, all these different nervous system stuff, you don't have to stress too much about this now. We haven't covered nervous systems yet, but we will be covering that on Monday. So once we cover that, we'll be making more reference to these um, nervous systems uh, names and nervous system divisions there. Okay. Um, Cool. So spread D will cover on uh, Monday because we should cover that all together. So it's easier for us to understand. Um, all right. So what I'll do is I'm just going to stop the recording here.